Surely you've already heard of Dirophilaria imitis, aka the heartworm. Dog owners dare only utter its name in fear, and other parasites worship it like a god. But every family has its black sheep. Hi, buddy. Listen, can I crash at your place tonight? My flat just burned down. I'm still shocked that farts are actually flammable. This is Dirophilaria repens, the subcutaneous worm. A close relative of the heartworm, and although less dangerous, it's still pretty annoying because it interferes with heartworm diagnostics due to its similarity to the species. Oh, and it causes cutaneous dirofilariasis. And more. It's an internal parasite of dogs and their relatives, but occasionally infects other species too, such as cats and people. Not very enthusiastically, though. Why do I have to deal with this sh It's indigenous in Africa and the Mediterranean, but it already invaded South and Central Europe a long time ago. If you're in America, you will not meet this parasite, but don't panic, you have twice as many heartworms there. The life cycle of Dirofilaria repens resembles that of the heartworm. The adult worm lives inside the infected animal, Precisely where it is and what it does, shreds corn or fixes rotary hose, we'll discuss a bit later. For now, let it suffice that the adult female releases microscopic worm larvae called microfilariae into the blood. Like, a lot. These play Superman in the circulation until they die, or with some luck get siphoned up by mosquitoes biting the host. Not warbles, not nosferati, mosquitoes. But of those, many species will do. The mosquito is the parasite's intermediate host. It flies away after biting and nurtures the tiny worm children inside its body for about two weeks, suspecting nothing. After molting twice and becoming third-stage larva, the parasite will travel into the mosquito's head. At this point, the bloodsucker will probably have an inkling that something is wrong, but would never admit to it. There's something on your face. No, there isn't! At the next bite, the parasites leave the mosquito in an elegant fashion, enter the host through the bite wound and continue their development feeding on tissue fluids. Sometimes they wander off inside the body, but more often they stay put and reach adulthood right under the skin in 6 to 9 months. But occasionally we find them in surprising places. It can happen that during routine abdominal surgery, the surgeon high-fives a dirofilaria worm when rummaging through the guts. It's unknown how exactly the male and the female find each other, but when they meet and fall in passionate love, the female will start producing microfilariae and the cycle closes in. Now, let's see what symptoms and damage subcutaneous worms can be responsible for. The disease, and you'd better sit down for this, but not on the stove, you idiot. Anyway, the disease comes with no noticeable symptoms in most cases. The adult worm under the skin can cause local flushing, itching or the emergence of a small, mostly painless bump. About the effects of circulating microfilariae, we don't have a lot of knowledge. According to some studies, they might cause vague general symptoms like tiredness and loss of appetite, and it's possible that they damage the kidneys in the long run, but most of the time their presence doesn't show on the host at all. Then what is the problem with this worm? Let's start by saying yuck. Second, subcutaneous worms can infect humans too, so maybe it's not a good idea to farm them in industrial quantities in our pets. In people, microfilariae either die early or don't even get produced, so we're unable to spread the infection any further, but the adult worm wiggling under your skin may lead to beautiful skin lesions just like the ones seen in dogs. The parasite can sometimes pull interesting stunts like taking residence in your eye under the conjunctiva or quite rarely in your lungs. The latter usually causes no symptoms, but the former might trigger hysterical laughing fits. <laughs> if you're not completely sane. Otherwise it just swells up and hurts. Asymptomatic cases barely ever get diagnosed, so we don't even know how often they occur, but considering people get stung by mosquitoes all the freaking time and we still don't see subcutaneous worms in every other person, we can assume that the infection is either mostly asymptomatic in us or just has a hard time taking hold. And third, Dirofilaria repens makes the diagnosis of heartworm infection more difficult. 
Of course, I'm not talking about when the dog is so full of heartworms that even Uncle Bob using a bat for ultrasound can tell what's wrong, but about the cases of early asymptomatic infections. But first, let's see how the presence of Dirofilaria repens is detected. Well, pulling an adult worm out of the dog from any body part is a certain diagnosis, but examining the blood is a bit more practical approach because circulating microfilariae can be seen under the microscope. Provided there are at least one fertile female and one fertile male present in the dog, and they are not in opposite ends of the body waiting for love that never comes. No mating, no microfilariae. Now, heartworms have their own microfilariae, which eerily resemble those of the subcutaneous worm. So much so that just by looking at the microfilariae, you can't tell if the host has dirofilaria imitis or repens infection, or maybe both. Rapid testing kits, not even requiring a microscope, also exist for detecting heartworms, but not subcutaneous worms. However, some heartworm testing kits occasionally mistake dirofilaria repens infection for heartworm presence, leaving the veterinarian confused as to which disease he's facing and why the hell he hadn't rather studied to become a lawyer anyway. The two infections can be differentiated with special methods, but they are generally more expensive and cannot be performed simply in the corner of the office after pushing the 10-year-old calendar and the Stradivari violin aside. This is why in those locations where heartworms and subcutaneous worms are both endemic, the veterinarian might just make your head explode with all the freaking tests they want to run to tell the two infections apart. They do it because differentiation is crucial for accurate prognosis and correct treatment. Speaking of treatment. Several different active ingredients are able to kill off subcutaneous worms, but licensed products for dogs at the time this video is released are way fewer. Namely, um, let's see, one. The passing of the worm can take months and depending on where it dies in the body, it may cause some trouble, but only very rarely. Therapy also destroys microfilariae. Without treating the dog, however, the parasite may live for several years, during which time it continuously keeps pumping out microfilariae. Therapy in humans, if at all necessary and possible, consists of surgically removing the worms. Since subcutaneous worm infection in dogs is most of the time asymptomatic and its treatment is generally easy, you may rightfully ask if putting time, money and effort into prevention is worth it at all. Well, of course it is. What did you expect? I mean, you don't notice if and when your dog gets infected and becomes a source of infection itself. And who can tell what or who it will infect next via a fat mosquito? Maybe your mother-in-law. And you know, skin and lungs and eyes and all that. And what kind of monster would like to see their mother-in-law get chewed on by worms? <clears throat> Prevention in dogs can be done on two fronts. First, by protecting your pet against invading worm larvae, for which there is only one licensed product at this time, or second, by preventing mosquito bites, for which several options are available. Ask your veterinarian about the details. Summing it up. Subcutaneous worms are dog parasites common in the old world. They also attack cats and people too on occasion. The infection comes mostly with mild or no symptoms, but can sometimes be rather annoying. Not to mention that together with the heartworm, they melt the brain of the everyday veterinarian. The parasite spreads invisibly, so using continuous preventive measures is recommended. I didn't do it. You're mistaking me for someone else. Just ask my mom. I don't even know what the f a heart is. The technical information in this video was fact checked by worm charmer Olga Yacho. I thank her very much, as much as I thank Bayer for its support. If you've made it this far, why not like, comment, or subscribe? Or check out my other videos. I know it would make at least one of us happy.